Hello, my name is Kevin Ohlendorf, and I'm the president of the Ohlendorf Appliance Laboratory. This two-part video series will discuss the Sasuni Plus cephalometric analysis. I'm not going to show you how to trace the x-ray or identify the landmarks and structures in this video. We have a great home study video that's available if you'd like to learn how to actually trace the x-ray. Instead, I'm going to focus on how to identify and answer the 15 questions that are associated with this analysis and provide some insight into what each one means and how you can use them to develop your treatment plan and also help avoid potential problems. Let's get started. This is a completed Sasuni Plus tracing. It was developed by Dr. Richard Beisel of Buchanan, Michigan. Dr. Beisel personally taught me how to trace the x-ray and interpret the results. He has been instrumental in teaching this version to doctors and helping them learn a better system to enhance their orthodontic treatment to allow them to provide better care to their patients. Sasuni Plus is very unique because it is a very visual analysis and uses a series of arcs to compare structures to. Most of the other analysis are linear and have a series of norms that tell you how the patient relates to predetermined normal measurements. Sasuni Plus relates anatomical structures to each other within the framework of the individual patient allowing the patient's own anatomy to serve as a clue to what is normal or abnormal. When you look at the tracing, you can get a visual description of the patient and begin to identify potential problems that may exist. Along with this tracing, we will complete an analysis sheet called the bottom line. It's a summary of the 15 questions and we will go through each question individually in these videos. Let's take a look. The first question we're going to answer is the skeletal AP or classification. Is the patient skeletally class 1, class 2, or class 3? In order to determine this, we look at the position of B point compared to the A arc. If B point is on the arc or one millimeter in front or behind the arc, the patient is class 1. If B point is 2 to 3 millimeters behind the arc, the patient's class 1 with a class 2 tendency. If B point is 2 to 3 millimeters in front of the arc, the patient's class 1 with a class 3 tendency. The farther behind the arc, or more negative the number, the more class 2 the patient is. The farther in front of the arc, or more positive the number, the more class 3 the patient is. In this case, B point is 5 millimeters behind the A arc, so the patient is class 2. Mandibular advancement may be needed to correct the skeletal class 2 relationship. By bringing the mandible forward, you can change the relationship from B point to the A arc. Here you can see a class 3 case. B point is 9 millimeters ahead of the A arc. The higher the number, the more severe the class 3, and the more difficult the case may be to treat. This case may require maxillary advancement in order to correct the class 3 relationship. In this case, B point is right on the A arc, so the patient is a solid class 1. Advancement most likely will not be needed, so you can eliminate that from your concerns as you treatment plan the case. One thing to remember is that the tracing provides you the skeletal classification. When you look at the models, you're determining the dental classification, and this can be different from the skeletal classification. The next question I will discuss is the skeletal vertical. Let's take a look. The next question is the skeletal vertical. This can be different from the dental vertical. This is measured from the x-ray to determine if the patient has a skeletal open bite, deep bite, or normal vertical. Menton is used as the reference point. If menton falls between the arcs, the patient has a normal skeletal vertical. If menton is above the top arc, this is a deep bite case. If menton is below the bottom arc, this is an open bite case. The skeletal vertical needs to be adjusted according to the patient's age. At age 4, menton should be at the top arc. Each year, the patient grows down 3 quarters of a millimeter until the patient is an adult and menton is on the bottom arc. At age 12, menton should be 6 millimeters below the top arc. 
This would mean the patient has a normal skeletal vertical. This factor incorporates tendencies to help provide a more exact representation of the vertical. When menton falls between the two arcs, the vertical is considered normal, but may have deep bite or open bite tendencies. Once you have located menton within the arcs, we draw another line that's called the age-adjusted menton. This is the point where menton should be for that patient according to the patient's age. You will then compare the actual position of menton with the should-be position. If the actual position is above the should-be position, the patient has a deep bite tendency. If the actual position is below the should-be, the patient has an open bite tendency. The farther away the should be from the actual, the stronger the tendency is. In this case, the patient's about 16 and the age-adjusted menton's right here. The actual menton is above the top arc, so the patient has a skeletal deep bite. Notice that the patient has a normal dental vertical. This will work in your favor. A combination of a deep dental and skeletal bite can be very difficult to open. In this case, the patient's about 12 years old by looking at the age-adjusted menton. The actual menton is below the bottom arc, so the patient is a skeletal open bite. These types of cases can be difficult to treat if there's very little dental overbite to work with. Any treatment may cause the dental bite to open, and a dental and skeletal open bite can be very difficult to close. This patient has a normal skeletal vertical. Menton is right on the age-adjusted arc for a 13 to 14 year old patient. If this patient were 18 years old, the skeletal vertical would be considered normal, but it would be a deep bite tendency. If the patient was 6 years old, the tendency would be towards an open bite. Anytime menton falls between the arcs, the skeletal vertical is normal, but there may be open bite or deep bite tendencies depending on the age of the patient. The next question I will discuss is the position of the upper incisors. The next question is the position of the upper incisor. The reference point is the tip of the most protruded upper central. We measure the distance of the upper central tip to the ANS arc. Ideally, the tip of the central should be within 0 to 4 millimeters beyond the arc to be considered normal. If it's greater than 4 millimeters, then the centrals are protruded. If they are behind the arc, they are retruded. In this case, the tip of the central is 7 millimeters beyond the arc, so it's protruded. Protruded upper anterior teeth can sometimes be a sign of a tongue thrust, especially if there is spacing between the teeth. It can also be a sign that there is crowding and arch development is needed. In this case, the tip of the central is behind the arc and is a negative measurement. This makes the anteriors retruded. Retruded anteriors can cause many problems such as trapping the mandible, which can lead to TMD symptoms. Most of the time, the patient will have crowding and a deep bite as well. When you flare the anteriors forward with a sagittal appliance, you can uncrowd the arch, open the dental deep bite, and allow room for the mandible to come forward. All of these movements will help your patients. Correcting retruded anteriors can be very important. As you can see from this x-ray, the anteriors are in a normal position at 3 millimeters beyond the ANS arc. If you have crowding that needs to be corrected, you will not be able to flare the anteriors forward any more than they already are. This question tells you the position of the upper anteriors. Next I will discuss the angle of the upper anteriors. In addition to the position of the upper incisor, Sasuni Plus also identifies the angle of the upper incisor. You will need to measure the angle from the long axis of the upper incisor to the palatal plane. 110 to 113 degrees is normal. Anything greater than 113 degrees, then the angle is high, and anything less than 110 degrees, and the angle is low. In this case, the angle is 83 degrees, so it's low. This angle helps to determine the length of the front end of the maxilla. When it's low like this, case, a sagittal can be used to develop the premaxilla forward and flare the anteriors forward. 
This will lengthen the maxilla and move ANS closer to the anterior arc where it should be. This example shows the angle is high, so you don't need or want to flare the anteriors forward. Most likely you will need to develop the arch in order to gain space to retract the anteriors and reduce the angle. In this case the angle is normal. A sagittal would not be needed in this case to flare the anteriors forward. If the maxilla was short anteriorly, it may be necessary to develop the premaxilla forward without flaring the teeth. If there is crowding, you may need to expand or distalize since the anterior portion of the maxilla cannot be developed anymore. A reverse pull face mask may also be needed to bring the entire maxilla forward to get ANS closer to the anterior arc. As an adjunct to this question, we extend the line of the long axis of the upper incisor to the optic plane and measure this angle as well. Use the same norms as you do with the palatal plane and this can be another way to check this angle. There can sometimes be some variables in the palatal plane that can give a misleading measurement. Now that we have looked at the upper incisors, let's take a look at the lower incisors. For the lower incisor, we measure the angle from the long axis of the most protruded incisor to the mandibular plane. 95 to 102 degrees is considered normal. If the angle is greater than 102 degrees, the anteriors are protruded. If the angle is less than 95 degrees, the angle is retruded. In this case, the angle is 106 degrees and they are protruded. When they are protruded, you will need to create some space in order to retract them. You can expand or distalize to create this space. Protruded anteriors can sometimes be a signal that the patient has a tongue thrust, so you may want to check for this as well. The patient has a 78 degree angle in this case, so the anteriors are retruded. In these types of cases, you can flare the anteriors forward to correct crowding if you need to. As they come forward, they will also open the dental bite as well. You will need to make sure that you have room to move the anteriors forward so some overjet is required. Having overjet will make it much easier to flare the anteriors forward. In this case, the angle is 99 degrees, and this indicates that the anteriors are in a normal position. You would not want to flare them forward very much during treatment. Expansion or distalization may be needed to uncrowd the lower arch in this case. Let's move on to the next question, the growth direction. In determining orthodontic treatment, it's important to know the growth direction of the patient. There is a vertical and horizontal component of growth, and knowing if one direction is stronger than the other can be a major component of treatment planning the case. In this analysis, we need to find the constructed gonion. It's the intersection of the ramal plane and the mandibular plane. Once you find this point, draw a line to nasion. This divides the angle into two parts. The top is the vertical component of growth and the range of normality is 52 to 55 degrees. The bottom angle is the horizontal component and the range is 70 to 75 degrees. A clockwise or vertical grower is indicated when the lower angle is greater than 75 degrees or the upper angle is less than 52 degrees. In this case, the upper angle is 49 degrees and the lower angle is 78 degrees, so the patient meets both requirements for a clockwise grower. When we look at this x-ray, you can see that the upper angle is 55 degrees and the lower angle is 68 degrees, so the patient is a counterclockwise grower. Anytime the lower angle is less than 70 degrees or the upper angle is 55 degrees or greater, the patient is a counterclockwise grower. In this case, the patient will grow more counterclockwise or horizontal than vertical or open. In class 3 cases, this can be a problem. The mandible will continue to grow longer and your treatment will have to compensate for the mandibular growth. In this case, the patient's a normal grower. The upper angle is 53 degrees and the lower angle is 72 degrees. So there is an equal amount of vertical and horizontal growth. Most of your patients are going to be normal or clockwise growers. 
This chart is a great reference guide to help you determine the growth direction. Once you have the measurements, find the upper angle and the lower angle and see where they meet on the chart. This will tell you the growth direction for your patient. If you would like a copy of this chart, email me and I'll send it out to you right away. Once you have determined the growth direction, we can move to the position of the upper first molars. For this question, we identify if the upper first molar is in the correct position. We compare the mesial of the first molar with the midfacial arc. If the mesial falls on the arc, it's in a normal position. If it's ahead of the arc, it's considered anteriorly positioned, and if it's behind the arc, it's posteriorly positioned. You will need to make a couple of adjustments to the midfacial arc to get an accurate reading. If A and S is behind the anterior arc, this deficiency should be factored in, and the midfacial arc should be moved distally the amount A and S is behind the anterior arc. Also, if the patient is in the mixed dentition and still has second deciduous molars, you'll need to make a 2 millimeter adjustment to compensate for the leeway space. The first molar will be 2 millimeters behind the arc because of the deciduous molars. In this case, the molar is in a posterior position. In this case, the molar is in an anterior position. It could have drifted forward due to a loss of deciduous teeth prematurely. If you look at the models, you would most likely see crowded arches and maybe blocked out cuspids. Distalization could be done to push the molars into a, a normal position and uncrowd the teeth. This molar is in a normal position. If you have crowding, you may not be able to distalize. Expansion or anterior development may be needed. You can see how the mesial of the molar is on the adjusted midfacial arc for this patient. The last question I will discuss in part one is the upper lip angle. Sasuni Plus uses the upper lip as a way to evaluate the profile. This angle is measured by drawing a line tangent to the most anterior tip of the upper lip through subnasally to the optic plane. This angle is then measured. A normal lip measures 100 to 115 degrees. If the angle is 116 degrees or greater, the lip's protruded. If the angle is 90 to 99 degrees, the lip is flat, and if the angle is less than 90 degrees, it's retruded. In this case, the angle is 98 degrees, so the lip is considered flat. You would want to avoid any treatment that would retract the anterior teeth or the maxilla. This would make the lip worse. Ideally, you would want to flare the anteriors forward to increase the angle and improve the profile. The upper lip in this case is 85 degrees, making it retruded. As you can see, the upper anteriors are also retruded. This, there is no lip support because the teeth are too far lingual. As they move out into a normal position, the lip angle will increase and the profile will improve. In this case, the angle is 112 degrees, so the angle is normal. In these types of cases, you would want to try and leave the anteriors in their current position so they don't make the profile too full or flatten it out. Here you can see that the angle indicates the lip is protruded. In these types of cases, you'd want to retract the anteriors. Bicuspid extraction could be an option to flatten the profile, or you could distalize to create space to uncrowd and retract. The upper lip angle can also help provide good profiles for your patients and help you avoid treatment options that may make the profile worse. It may help you decide if extraction or non-extraction treatment would be better. This concludes part one of our video on the Sasuni Plus analysis. As you have seen, this analysis provides a tremendous amount of information and can be very helpful when you're developing your treatment plan. In part two, I'll discuss how to determine the length and position of the maxilla and the mandible. No other analysis gives you such a complete picture or evaluation of the maxilla and the mandible. Our laboratory has a complete records department. We fabricate display or study models and can trace your CEPHs for you and provide any analysis you need, including the Sasuni Plus. 
We offer traditional records as well as digital display models and computerized cephalometric tracings. One of our most popular services is our complete orthodontic records package. This package includes a set of display models, a cephalometric tracing and analysis of your choice, and a model analysis. As an additional service, we can also include an appliance review letter. This letter provides a summary of the cephalometric analysis and model analysis. We will also offer suggestions of possible appliances you can use and offer tips on things to watch out for during treatment. If you'd like more information about our orthodontic records package, you can visit our website or give us a call. Be sure to watch part two in order to complete your education of the Sasuni Plus analysis.